Okay, folks, I hope you're all watered and fed. We're about to get underway. Good. Grab a seat if you can somewhere, Richard. You'd be lucky. All right, my name is Bruce Hocking. I'm your tour guide for this evening on the subject of asthma in the workplace, and our speaker is Ryan Hoy. Um, respiratory physician, but also just about a member of the club. He did the uh, graduate dip in occupational environmental health at Monash, so he speaks our language as well. Um, tonight, we've got two or three learning aims in mind for you. And this is particularly relevant to the trainees. Um, occupational asthma is a pretty obvious topic for an exam question, either oral or written. And we're going to try to help you cover what I think would be the essentials uh, for you in this uh, topic. So we want uh, even the uh, older train fellows in the audience uh, to update their knowledge of management of work exacerbated asthma. This is seen to update their knowledge of diagnosis and manage of occupational asthmas. And to help you understand some of the, what's going on here in uh, this, there is the pre-reading that was provided to you as an online link to Ryan's article in Australian Family Physician, which is really cornerstone stuff for the trainees on the subject of occupational asthma. In that article, there is this flowchart, which quite usefully breaks up the area we're going to be travelling tonight. At the top, you've got your work-related asthma, a sort of generic catch-all term. And that subdivides into occupational asthma, the asthmas which are caused by substances in the workplace. And that in turn subdivides into sensitizer induced asthmas, uh, those for which there is a known immunological basis or believed to be, as distinct from the irritant induced occupational asthmas, which um, many years ago used to be called RADS or uh, reactive airway dysfunction syndrome uh, that you'll still see in the book. So there's a subdivision there of the occupational asthma, but that's a territory which um, we feel particularly um, interested in because of, uh, although there are over 200 chemicals related to asthma these days, uh, we've got a bit of proprietorial interest in it as it is clearly related to the workplace. Now, the paradox is though that the work exacerbated asthma is possibly the more important and more problematic. Because of the prevalence of asthma in the community in the teen years and so forth, you're going to have quite a lot of uh, teenagers who are looking for jobs in the military, in emergency services, fire brigades and so forth, underwater work, where asthma is not a great thing to have. And there's going to have to be decisions about, about their entry uh, into those occupations, which will come back to many of you in, in your work. And uh, so Ryan is going to be giving us um, information that's not all that easily obtainable uh, elsewhere this evening. Um, I should have also said uh, welcome to some uh, people we've got online from interstate. I can't see you, but um, welcome to several people from New South, I think, Canberra and uh, maybe Tasmania. Okay, with that as a way of introduction, um, I welcome Ryan to take us through the evening. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks very much for the invitation to uh, talk tonight. Just pull up my presentation. Always uh, was a relish the opportunity to talk about uh, occupational asthma or work uh, exacerbated asthma, really, to uh, to any audience. I bore the uh, respiratory physicians about it quite a lot, so it's good to have a, a different audience tonight. 
Um, so I'm going to be talking about work-related asthma. Um, so my background is as a respiratory physician, so I'm based at Cabrini and it's uh, the Alfred Hospital. Um, so I've actually got a master's degree, Bruce, not a grad dip in occupational environmental medicine. And I'm a, a, a research fellow at uh, the Monash Centre for Occupational Environmental Health as well. And um, so this is a bit of an overview of what I'm going to talk about. So talk about some issues generally in terms of asthma and the workplace. I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about what asthma actually is, because I think this is a really important basis for the rest of the, uh, the discussion tonight. Uh, work exacerbated asthma, occupational asthma, diagnosis, how it relates to both those conditions, and then very importantly, prevention as well. So asthma and work can influence each other in many ways. At work exposures can cause asthma, and that's what we refer to as occupational asthma. Work exposures can worsen asthma control and pre-existing asthma, and that's what we refer to as work exacerbated asthma. But asthma can also, work exposures can also cause these uh, asthma variants, so conditions like eosinophilic bronchitis or uh, aluminium pot room asthma. And it can also cause conditions which can be really difficult to differentiate from asthma, and in particular, upper airway dysfunction or irritable larynx sy syndrome, vocal cord dysfunction related to irritant exposure to the workplace. And if we've got time, we can talk a little bit more about that. But um, as Bruce alluded to as well, one of the other issues is that the presence of asthma can also affect an individual's ability to actually work in a particular environment. So it may need to be considered when assessing a worker's fitness to undertake a role such as occupational scuba diving, as we can see here uh, in military recruits or in firefighters, for example. So, um, is it asthma? Is it asthma is the, always the, the first question to ask yourself when you're diagnosing either occupational asthma or work exacerbated asthma. And I am going to go through a lot of the basics of asthma, first of all, because again, I think this is really important. And you may think that the diagnosis of asthma is very straightforward, but I work as at uh, a difficult asthma clinic at uh, the Alfred Hospital, which is where we have patients referred from other respiratory physicians from Melbourne, from within our home hospital, from around the state. And uh, probably around about 30% of the patients that have been referred to us with difficult asthma don't actually have asthma when we go through a really systematic approach to the diagnosis. So asthma is, however, a common disease. It's a disease that has been diagnosed in Victoria and 21% of people by the time they reach 18 years of age. So 21% of 18-year-olds have ever had the diagnosis of asthma. Whereas when we look at active asthma, the, difference is, the numbers are quite different. So 11 to 13% of children have active asthma in comparison to 9 to 11% of adults. So therefore there are many children that have asthma and then it goes away and it's not present during adult life. And then there are some people who develop asthma for the first time later in life. The, uh, the prevalence of asthma has changed over time. Uh, it increased quite a lot in the 1980s, 1990s, but then it's plateaued over the last uh, few years and maybe tailored off a little bit uh, recently. So although asthma is common, uh, it's really important to think about what else it could be when somebody presents with symptoms suggestive of asthma. And this is uh, a list that I like to have in my mind when I think about, uh, when I see these patients. And uh, the top of my mind is always this condition of vocal cord dysfunction or uh, laryngeal dysfunction, which is something that um, many doctors wouldn't really come across as a diagnosis. But um, we estimate that upper airway dysfunction is likely to be the cause of respiratory symptoms in about, about 10 to 20 per cent of people that have been diagnosed with asthma. COPD obviously can be very difficult to differentiate from asthma, especially those people that have chronic asthma, maybe have some fixed airflow obstruction, have a history of smoking as well. So how much of that COPD, the airflow obstruction is actually asthma versus COPD. Um, cardiac failure, lack of fitness. So patients just presenting as they're short of breath, you know, there must be something wrong with me, but it's actually because they're pretty overweight and they're not exercising and other factors may be at play. 
Uh, other rare things like bronchiectasis, uh, cystic fibrosis, bronchiolitis obliterans, hypersensitivity and pneumonitis can be quite difficult to differentiate from occupational asthma because patients will present with intermittent symptoms, may be associated with a workplace exposure, often will present with cough, shortness of breath and wheeze. Um, and then other things that we really don't want to miss, like, uh, like cancer, lung cancer, cancer in the large airways causing obstruction, um, and then other upper airway conditions like rhinosinusitis, which can also be work-related, um, anxiety, upper airway respiratory tract uh, irritation. So what is asthma? So asthma is a chronic inflammatory disease of the airways. And so there are many cells and cellular elements that play a role in asthma, so mast cells, eosinophils, T lymphocytes, etc. And in susceptible individuals, this inflammation will cause recurrent episodes of wheeze, breathlessness, chest tightness and cough, and particularly at night and early in the morning. And the episodes are usually associated with uh, variable but often widespread airflow obstruction in the lungs. And that's usually reversible either spontaneously or with treatment. And the inflammation of the airways is also associated with airway hyperresponsiveness, which is one of the other key features of, uh, of asthma, which is important when we're talking about diagnosis. So this is uh, to, to remind you of your histology of uh, the airways. So normal airways, we have uh, intact uh, surface pseudostratified uh, columnar epithelium. And then we have a really um, uh, indistinct basement membrane. So it's quite hard to see the basement membrane here. And there's few inflammatory cells and a pretty small amount of bronchial smooth muscle. But then in asthma, this is mild asthma, you start seeing this goblet cell hyperplasia. So you can start seeing these goblet cells where there's more mucus being produced and the sub-basement membrane starts to thicken and we start to see it a little bit more uh, evidently than in somebody that doesn't have asthma. And there's more of a cellular infiltrate now. And then in severe asthma, we see very severe airway uh, obstruction, so airflow limitation would be caused by this narrowing, and that's due to a combination of inflammation in the airway walls as well as uh, deposition of uh, fibrous tissue and hypertrophy of the smooth muscle around the airways too. So there's no gold standard for the diagnosis of asthma. It's based on history and supportive investigations. S history of asthma symptoms, you know, we know pretty typical, things like shortness of breath, wheeze, chest tightness, cough, um, often with chronic uh, symptoms, you'll get some sputum production with it, and generally episodic symptoms. And frequently we have a history of atopy, so an atopic condition, an allergic condition associated with it, whether it's hay fever themselves or a family history of atopy. And with asthma, there are typically triggers, so symptoms are provoked by certain exposures. And that might be exposure to an allergen, so a non-occupational allergen like uh, dust mite, as we can see in this picture just here, the menacing dust mite, um, animal dander or molds. Um, presence of rhinosinusitis can cause airway inflammation and exacerbate asthma. Obviously, respiratory tract infections, respiratory irritants, cold air, some drugs will trigger asthma. Emotional factors may trigger asthma symptoms, exercise, reflux, and obviously occupational factors, which we'll talk more about. So getting a history of triggers for those respiratory symptoms is really important. So investigators so never assume that shortness of breath is due to asthma without lung function testing. And the same thing with, uh, with presence of cough as well. And the aim of respiratory function testing in the setting is to identify airflow obstruction that is at least partially reversible and possibly looking for evidence of bronchial hyperresponsiveness as well. So there's several tests that we have available to us. So the first one is spirometry with bronchodilator testing, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, many of you do in your own rooms, which I'll, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Peak flow charts uh, really can be very useful, especially if uh, spirometry is not, uh, not available in your practice and you can't uh, refer patients to a respiratory lab. 
and then bronchial provocation testing, which I'll also talk about. And then sometimes we do ancillary testing where we're testing for um, evidence of atopy, so, uh, so sensitisation towards some environmental and sometimes some occupational agents as well through skin prick testing or RAS testing, which is a blood test. So I know I'm labouring the point about uh, diagnosis of asthma, but I think it's really important. Um, so spirometry, can I just get a show of hands as to how many people do spirometry in their own rooms? Yeah, so a significant proportion of uh, the audience here, so you're, you should all uh, be experts at this. And as you know, it's a very much a, uh, a patient-dependent test, a patient-effort-dependent test. It's very much dependent on the effort that the operator puts in as well, that you really have an operator that, uh, that can instruct patients accordingly to really get uh, a, a really good effort and consistent effort out of them without really annoying the patient at the same time, which can be quite difficult and very much dependent on the, uh, the interpreter, so who's actually looking at the results. So you can't rely upon the, uh, the computer-generated reports that uh, some of these uh, um, devices will spit out. There's some excellent resources online for uh, how to perform spirometry, and the National Asthma Council have some excellent uh, resources generally, but um, some videos which go through uh, appropriate technique for spirometry. And um, again, I'm probably labouring the point since many of you do this already, but spirometry is a method of assessing lung function by measuring timed inspired and expired volumes. And we use those volumes to calculate how effectively and quickly the lungs can be filled and emptied. And it's a measure of uh, severity of airway obstruction uh, by comparing that to uh, normal values. So uh, typical electronic desktop uh, spirometer. Um, many things that you need to be aware of when performing spirometry. It, it, the, uh, there are different guidelines in terms of uh, how to perform spirometry, uh, whether it's using the Thoracic Society uh, guidelines um, or the ATS guidelines, which the, uh, the medical uh, uh, panels and um, TAC, I think, still uh, require us to do. Um, as well as uh, factors that are important to know of when actually interpreting spirometry as well. So those patient effort related uh, factors, um, whether there's presence of uh, coughing during the test manoeuvres, tongue occlusion, so the patient's trying to blow out but the tongue keeps getting stuck in the, uh, in the outflow tract, um, whether the patients have made a maximal expiratory and inspiratory effort, and so there's various things that can be looked at to ensure that they have actually met those, uh, those, uh, those factors affecting um, uh, re reproducibility. And so, for example, this is what we want to see in a really acceptable manoeuvre. So the, uh, the, the expiratory and then the inspiratory limbs here. The, um, the dotted line here is the predicted values. So you can see this patient would be very normal. So no scalloping of the, uh, the expiratory flow here. So very normal spirometry. This would be a typical sub-maximal effort. A patient not uh, inspiring to total lung capacity before the expiration, coughing during the, uh, the test and various other factors as well just to be aware of uh, when performing spirometry. Very, very common uh, problem. And we look at indices such as FEV1, so the amount of air blown out of the first second, uh, forced vital capacity, um, and obviously the FEV1 over FVC ratio, which I won't go into too much detail about, but these are the main patterns that we're looking for. So evidence of obstructive lung disease, so reduction in the uh, FEV1, usually of this rate, well, definitely of this ratio, but sometimes of uh, vital capacity as well. Restriction where you get a reduction in uh, vital capacity in particular, and then a normal um, a ratio, and then a mixed pattern sometimes. And this is an excellent resource as well, the uh, interpretation of spirometry um, that was published by, um, uh, by Rob Pierce, which is available to download uh, for free on the National Asthma Council website. Now, reversibility testing, is this something also that people routinely do when they're doing um, office spirometry? A show of hands for those that do reversibility testing. So fewer hands have gone up than, uh, than previously. And so reversibility testing is where we're assessing whether that 
airflow obstruction is responsive to a bronchodilator. And the patient needs to be stable, clinically stable, no recent respiratory tract infections, withhold medication, the short-acting beta agonists for the last six hours, uh, long-acting beta agonists for 12 hours, no theophylline for the last 24 hours. And then we measure baseline spirometry and then we give a bronchodilator at a high dose, a high dose to the therapeutic range. So it's usually only actually two to four puffs of Ventolin through a puffer and spacer and then repeat spirometry after uh, 15 to uh, 30 minutes. It's usually about 15 minutes. And then calculate whether there's been a change from baseline to the uh, repeat testing. And a significant difference is when there's an increase of 12% and 200 mils after the bronchodilator has been administered. So that bronchodilator response is uh, evidence of uh, variable airflow obstruction, but it's not diagnostic of asthma by itself it needs to be uh, assessed in conjunction with the clinical history. But if somebody has complete reversibility of their obstruction, so the ratio is less than 70%, and then after the bronchodilator is given, they're not actually obstructed, essentially that's diagnostic of asthma, or if you have a very, very large response to Ventolin. So it's a really important part of testing anybody that you consider may have asthma. But COPD and asthma aren't, diagnostic, aren't diagnosed by spirometry alone. You really need that clinical history. So this is um, a pretty typical uh, patient with airflow obstruction. So their baseline uh, expiratory uh, flow um, volume loop, where we will see that they are obstructed. So their baseline FEV1 is considerably reduced at 1.52. And the ratio of the FEV1 to FVC is uh, far less than 70, so it's 37. So they clearly got an obstructive defect. And so if you just stopped at that point, then you wouldn't really know whether this is COPD or asthma. But then performing a bronchodilator response, we can see that there's a very large improvement in their FEV1 post bronchodilator. There's a 49% improvement. So this is a post bronchodilator curve. Uh, they're still obstructed afterwards, so the ratio is still less than 70, so it's not completely reversed, but there is a very large improvement, so that'd be very suggestive of asthma, not COPD. Again, you've got to interpret this with the, uh, the clinical context, so if they've been a very heavy smoker as well, maybe there is COPD, asthma overlap, but uh, in this situation I'd be leaning more towards, uh, towards asthma. But if you have somebody that has normal spirometry, and this is really important for uh, work-related asthma, because often we're seeing these workers when they are asymptomatic. If you perform spirometry and it's normal, that does not exclude the presence of asthma, because as I said before, the other main feature of asthma is airway hyperresponsiveness. And between episodes of asthma symptoms and asthma um, flare-ups, uh, lung function we expect to be normal. So performing spirometry alone won't diagnose asthma in that situation. So that's when we go on and do bronchial provocation testing. And it's essentially a, it's a test where we're assessing airway hyperresponsiveness. So the, uh, the likelihood that airways are going to narrow in response to various stimuli. And so that's either through um, increasing doses of an agonist or a particular stimuli. And we measure a drop in their FEV1 from baseline of either 20% or 15%, depending on what the agent we use actually is. So these are the typical bronchial provocation agents that we use. So um, in Melbourne now, and actually in Australia probably more generally, mannitol, aridol is the trade name, is the most common agent that's used. It um, was uh, developed by uh, Sandy Anderson, in, no, Susan, no, Sandy Anderson, yeah, Sandy Anderson in, um, in, in Sydney. And it's um, a very easy to administer uh, agent. So this is the inhaler device here. So it looks very similar to, um, to the, um, the Seabree uh, handy inhaler, the, uh, similar to the Spireva one. So essentially a little capsule goes into the chamber, it's squeezed, and then the patient breathes in the dose of mannitol. And we start with a really tiny dose and then build up 
sequentially during the test. And mannitol, as I say, is the most commonly used agent these days, and it's an indirect challenge. It changes the uh, osmolality of the, uh, the airways, and that then results in a sort of cascade of uh, responses leading to uh, bronchoconstriction. There are some other indirect challenges that we use, like hypertonic saline. Um, this great one called eucapnic voluntary hyperpnea, which is essentially where we get patients to breathe over and over and over again into a um, into a sack and dry out their airways that way, and then that causes um, similar uh, indirect um, release of mediators, causing bronchoconstriction. Um, exercise challenges. And then we have the ones that many of you are probably more familiar with, which are the direct challenges, which are the pharmacological agents, so histamine and uh, methacholine. And then there's the specific challenges with occupational agents, which um, I won't really talk about, because, even though I'm talking about work-related asthma, because it's not offered in Australia. There's no lab in Australia that actually performs specific occupational um, inhalational challenges. So when we do these uh, bronchoprovocation tests, it does give us a marker of uh, severity of airflow hyperresponsiveness. So whether it's mild, moderate or severe, which can be helpful for us to assess the severity of asthma as well. So I'm going to get back to the main brief for tonight, which is uh, talking about uh, work-related asthma. And work-related asthma is a really useful, all-encompassing term. And it encompasses um, both occupational asthma and work exacerbated asthma. It can sometimes be very difficult to differentiate those two conditions. And so sometimes we may end up with a final diagnosis of work-related asthma and not be able to tease out which one it actually is, which is okay as well. But occupational asthma is an occupational disease. It's a disease that's uh, uh, characterised by the main features of asthma, so variable airflow limitation, airway hyperresponsiveness and or airway inflammation due to causes and conditions which are attributable to a particular occupational environment. So it's caused by a particular occupational exposure, something that's not outside the workplace. So it's a condition that that person, it's a, it's a development of asthma in that person that they would not have actually developed if they weren't actually exposed to that agent of the workplace. And it's a preventable occupational disease. It's one where with control of exposure to those agents, uh, it can actually be prevented. And this is differentiated from work exacerbated asthma, which is when somebody has pre-existing asthma, their asthma is not actually caused by work, and their asthma is worsened by workplace conditions. So work exacerbated asthma is over here, and it is often pushed to the side, as it is in this, uh, this uh, um, flow chart here. There's been much less uh, research done in work exacerbated asthma than occupational asthma, um, much less thought given to it in terms of uh, diagnostic approaches. Um, but it's very common and it's actually more common than occupational asthma. And work exacerbated asthma may range from a single transient exacerbation of asthma after a particular exposure at work it might be an unusual exposure at work, so there's been a, a, a small fire in the kitchen, the, the toaster uh, has burnt and uh, a worker has gone into the kitchen and exposure to the, uh, the smoke fumes have triggered off an asthma exacerbation. Or it may be exposure to something more on a regular basis which is causing frequent uh, exacerbations or, or persistent worsening of their asthma symptoms. And it's been estimated to occur in up to 25% uh, of people that are working that have a diagnosis of asthma, so a quarter of all asthmatics uh, that are working. And work exacerbated asthma tends to cause asthma that's, uh, that's more severe um, and more severe than occupational asthma, more severe than non-work related asthma as well. So it's something that we always screen for as part of our uh, difficult asthma service at the Alfred. Often people with work exacerbated asthma um, have uh, higher incidence of uh, smoking. Uh, they tend to be less atopic and uh, not surprisingly they have higher uh, medication usage than, uh, than other groups. 
There's, uh, there's a range of occupational exposures that can worsen asthma control and it may be specific inhaled agents at the workplace, so it might be uh, dust, it may be smoke, fumes, sprays, um, some common environmental allergens that are encountered at work. So, for example, a, um, a, a groundskeeper with a background history of uh, seasonal allergic rhinitis and asthma, and then working outside during the grass pollen season, having to cut lawns, uh, exposure to, uh, to the grass pollen exacerbating asthma would be a, a cause of work exacerbated asthma. And then there may be uh, physical factors. As I mentioned before, physical factors can certainly exacerbate asthma or trigger asthma. So it may be uh, temperature, in particular shifts in temperature. So somebody that's going from a, uh, 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 a comfortable in, uh, temperature to a cold environment. So, uh, for example, somebody that works at a, um, at a supermarket that maybe has to go in and out of the cold room quite a lot during the daytime. I remember seeing a patient that was a, uh, a security guard and uh, would have to do rounds outside at night and that was certainly worsening his asthma control. Uh, humidity, uh, working down to local swimming pool, uh, physical exercise, so uh, walking up and down stairs at work may be a factor for somebody that has uh, uh, difficult to control asthma and then that exertion worsens their asthma control. Or it might be other factors such as uh, picking up respiratory infections at the workplace or workplace stress. You know, we all know that stress can worsen asthma control and if there is uh, some bullying or other factors going on at work, that may worsen asthma as well. So to think more broadly than just uh, a worker in a dusty environment. So these are the, uh, the criteria that uh, were published by the American Thoracic Society for the diagnosis of work exacerbated asthma. And I think they are useful. Uh, they, we haven't at this point developed um, uh, Australian criteria, but it is a work in progress at the moment. Uh, the, their four criteria are that the worker has pre-existing asthma or developed concurrent asthma. So their asthma is developed as an adult, but not actually due to work. Or their and and sorry, their asthma has a, a temporal association with their work. So their symptoms they may report their symptoms are worse due to particular work exposures. That they have an increase in medication use related to their work. So they're using their short-acting beta agonists more frequently at work or using some objective measures such as serial peak flow recordings where we see a decline in, in, uh, in reading, so more significant airflow obstruction when they're actually at work than away from work. And criteria three is that uh, conditions at work, exist at work that can exacerbate asthma and that comes back to taking your occupational history about the exposures that that worker is going to be uh, dealing with at their workplace. And in your opinion, are those exposures something that can actually worsen their asthma control? And four is that asthma caused by work, so occupational asthma, is unlikely. So, uh, for example, is the worker actually a spray painter uh, not being provided good uh, respiratory protection? Their asthma has just developed recently, or the symptoms have just developed recently. Perhaps that's more likely that it's actually isocyanate-related occupational asthma rather than work exacerbated asthma. So thinking about uh, whether it may be occupational is important too. So in terms of management of work exacerbated asthma, the aim really is to identify what the exacerbating factor is at work, whether it's the dust, whether it's the worker having to go outside into the cold environment and try to modify that exposure as far as is practical. And as you all know, that uh, can be very difficult. You know, it requires uh, communication with the, uh, the employer if, it's, if the worker consents to you doing that. Uh, the worker may be very reluctant for you to get involved in what's actually happening at work. Um, but it can be really useful in terms of actually uh, managing the patient. Um, and then assessing the, uh, the risk of undertaking their job based on the inherent requirements of the position. And so what I mean by that is the uh, situation of the uh, firefighter or the, uh, the, the occupational scuba diver 
what is the risk now that they're presenting with symptoms suggestive of work exacerbated asthma in them undertaking their job with that history of asthma? So does that influence your decision as to whether you feel they can actually remain in that position or not? Um, the, the, the risk of uh, consequences when you have an exacerbation as a firefighter or a scuba diver or in the military is obviously much, much uh, greater than if you were working um, in an office environment. And if you feel that the, uh, the worker can continue in that environment, uh, if there is still some risk, you should be bringing the worker back for a periodic uh, review and develop a plan with them as to how frequently you think that review should be. Their asthma should just be managed like asthma according to the normal practice guidelines in terms of the, uh, the medical management of asthma, in terms of the inhalers, um, prescribing based on those guidelines, education about uh, device usage, uh, um, demonstration of how to use a spacer, all those sort of really fundamental things. And they should all have a written asthma action plan. And it's only about uh, 15 or 20 per cent of people with asthma actually have a written asthma action plan. In this situation, it should be 100 per cent of workers with a history of asthma. And that, that action plan is something that they should understand and a copy with the worker's consent should also go to the OHS department uh, or the safety officer and it should be on the wall in the other uh, room there too. So um, I've just sort of been talking for quite a while so it might be a good chance for you to talk to each other for a little bit. We've got a couple of cases to go through. This is the, the first one which I might let uh, Bruce... Uh, okay, we're going to do a bit of group work. Who are the trainees here tonight please? We've got some trainees, one, two, three. Now, can you break yourselves out to different tables because you're going to be the spokesperson for the table. So one of you over there, one of you over there, one of you over there, take your chairs and move, please. Okay, if there happens to be two of you at one table, that's fine, but I do want you to spread yourself around. We need one over at this table here, please. Okay then, so Ryan and I have worked out a, a, a little bit of a scenario here. Um, this is about John who's 18 years old and he's applied for a job at Swell Furniture to become a furniture maker. He's going to be an apprentice in other words. And he'll work both in a sawmill, which is cutting um, lengths of timber into like legs and backs that will go on tables and chairs, and sanding wood. Now the sanding obviously produces very fine dust because you're wanting very, very smooth uh, for, uh, wood uh, for the, the finished product so that it can then be varnished and so forth. So sanding produces a very fine dust, cutting wood is a bit coarser sawdust. Um, there is, um, you can take it, that there is some extraction uh, of the dust that's being produced with those machines uh, in a moderately well run um, furniture making factory. And on his pre-employment form, he declares he has a history of asthma. The company refers him to you for assessment, being mindful of their duty of care and their compliance with disability discrimination legislation, the usual thing about how do we weigh this up. So first of all, what is the concern? How would you assess him? Secondly, what work exposures are of concern? Is his risk of developing occupational asthma increased because of his history of asthma? And should he wear a dust mask and should he have regular lung function tests in future? So there's the sort of things we want you to work through in your group over the next five or ten minutes, please. And then I'll work around with the trainees speaking on behalf of your table in response to these questions. You folks are interstate, I'm afraid you'll have to work through yourself. Uh, but these are pretty reasonable questions that could come up in an oral. Okay, over to you guys. If you're, 
you're wanting to use group chat to discuss the case study if you're on the video conference, if you just hover the mouse over your you can actually hover the mouse over the presentation and double click on it go bigger for you so you can read it properly. Hello, is that better? Whatever you want. Uh, please keep going, don't worry about all this. It's actually not working so I'll, I'll make it bigger for you. Thank you. 
Okay then, let's start working our way around the tables. Um, I think just for the sake of it, we'd, we'll begin over here if we would. First of all, what was your table's view on what do you actually think is the concern and how would you assess him? Did you have, oh thanks for the mic. Yes, to the lady. Yeah, what did your table make out of this first opening gambit about is there a concern, what is it? And yeah. how would you go about assessing him? Yeah, there's definitely concerns because he'll be working with an, in an environment where there's dust and fine dust. There's a risk of uh, his asthma being exacerbated. Um, we have to also think of other chemicals or um, substance that's within the environment. Um, for, for example, chemicals that might be present that can be another trigger for his uh, exacerbation. Um, and in, in addition, depending on what workplace, there might be physical factors as well, like uh, humidity, cold heat. Um, yeah, so that's, that's our concerns. Okay. Let's take another table over here. Would, I know you've got a couple of people there, but would one of you have a crack at the first question, what is the concern and how would you go about assessing him? Where do you start in assessing this fella? Okay, we're going up the back. All right. Um, so first of all, we want to know whether he really had a proper diagnosis of asthma. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of um, young kids, when they go to the hospital emergency department with um, a bit of cough, people will try them on Ventolin and then they get the diagnosis of asthma because it's pretty difficult to um, get a young baby or, you know, a toddler to do a lung function test. So that's you know, basically what, how some people are diagnosed with asthma, they are given that label when they were young. So now we want to make sure that they really, you know, had uh, this guy really had um, as, have asthma. So we want to uh, take a full history um, 
focusing on things like, okay, um, how long were you diagnosed for? Do you still have the symptoms? Uh, do you still use your Ventolin? What other uh, medication or puffers you use? Uh, what are your triggers? Um, and um, do you see um, any specialists? Um, how severe it is? Have you been admitted to the ICU before? Um, also, things like um, easy smoking. Um, also, things like um, has he been exposed to you know dust previously? Maybe his um, dad works in the garage um, sawing wood, and he never had a problem with that, um, even when helping his dad. So that's a you know good. Um, right. So you've drilled in pretty hard on has this guy really got a problem in the first place? Yeah. Are we just taking his word he's got asthma or is it pretty well documented? And also, although he's 18, when did he have his last asthma attack? Was it when he was eight years old or was it only last year that he had asthma? Um, as it, it's all these things to think about, the relevance of it to this. And then your question about assessing his asthma has come up and then we'll get into the next parts. Ryan, do you want to make some comments on the answers you've heard so far? Yeah, I think um, I think that's exactly right, Bruce. The, the, the first question is, uh, how relevant is his history of asthma? So he's been very honest in, uh, in going through his pre-employment form and he's honestly said that he's got a history of asthma, but we don't know is that actually active asthma or is it a history of doctor-diagnosed asthma when he was young? So uh, first of all, assessing whether he's got active asthma and then trying to characterise his asthma even more. So has he got very mild intermittent asthma? Is it only when he exercises and occasionally uses his Ventolin? Or is it more frequent symptoms? Is he at risk of more severe exacerbations? Has he got more uh, risk factors of uh, worsening asthma control? Which may be an issue in terms of uh, the environment that he's going into. But also just keeping in mind the level of risk there is in this environment of him having an exacerbation and what the outcome of that exacerbation would be. Working in a sawmill versus being a firefighter, you know, the risk of the outcome is a bit different when you're assessing this, uh, the worker. Okay, now we'll continue on there with the second line of questions about what are the actual things in this work environment that could be of concern? Uh, with regard to asthma, like whether it's occupational asthma or whether it's work exacerbated asthma, when you begin thinking about this very brief occupational description, what are the things that you begin to add in? And um, then there was a rider to that, is his risk of developing occupational asthma, as defined by Ryan earlier, increased because of his history of asthma? So first of all, the broad question, what exposures were of concern? So table over here, would you please begin? Um, so for the work exposures, it's mainly the dust and also the type of food that he will be working with. So um, western red cedar is yep. a common type of food that can cause occupational asthma. So for him, he won't have an increased risk of developing occupational asthma, but he may have an increased risk in developing work um, accessibility asthma if his asthma is not under control. Yeah, so there's two aspects of this. One is exacerbating asthma and yeah. the other is possible allergens within the workplace that could cause asthma in its own right yeah. that you're getting at. Table up the back there. Yep, you've just got the microphone given to you. Um, who's the trainee there that's going to speak? Yeah, please um, address this question. What work exposures are of concern? And is his risk of developing occupational asthma increased because of his history of asthma? What are the things in the workplace that might concern you? Well, we think it's covered many of them, I think. We also are very keen to know about the types of wood, of course, and it's quite important to know what processes these woods are going to undergo as well, whether these are going to be treated with any form of glue or preservative. We want to know if our man is also going to be assembling the furniture, which may significantly increase the likelihood of working with glue. Are there any particular glues that would interest you about assembling furniture? Uh, I, I 
did come across one, but I can't remember. Okay. How, and uh, also within wood, is there any particular other? You mentioned about Western redwood cedar. Are there any other particular woods that people in general want to speak up about that interest us? I don't know. Black, or black, but I, I stand to be corrected. It's a Tasmanian blackwood, isn't it? It's yeah. Interest you guys? So, although um, everybody knows of Western red cedar, it's not been demonstrated that that's actually the most common wood that uh, causes occupational aspirin. It's just the most well characterised. So, uh, there's a, uh, there was a lot of research interest in it in uh, in Vancouver, and uh, they uh, identified there was uh, plicatic acid, which is a particular uh, a chemical which is actually in the wood that was the sensitiser and the cause of uh, occupational aspirin in that setting. It's just that the other woods haven't been well uh, described or characterised as well as Western Red Cedar. And I think blackwood is definitely one that is a problem in Australia. I've certainly seen cases of it, but if you look at the literature, I don't think it's really been described well at all. Unfortunately, the work, well, the person I saw wasn't didn't develop asthma from their work exposure. It was actually from hobby that he had asthma. So, but I think anecdotally, blackwood is a, is an issue. Um, but the other, a lot of the other woods haven't been very well described. And related to this is the um, medium density fibre wood um, that's held together with formaldehydes. Uh, and so they'll be released on working with it as well. So quite a range of things there. And then I'm glad you picked up about the actual assembly of the furniture as well. Uh, blues, perhaps even polyurethanes uh, used in, as adhesives uh, in there. Um, so there's a range of things to think about. And dust in its own right, I think we could put that in, couldn't we? It doesn't have to be the chemical aspect of it. It's just the irritancy of very, very fine dust. Yeah, it can it could certainly potentially be a cause of irritant induced asthma, but probably in this situation, if he does have active asthma, then be more likely work exacerbated asthma, I think, rather than occupational asthma. Yes, I must admit the question was a bit loosely phrased by myself, and we're trying to bring out these two things together about what things are the environment that could cause work exacerbated asthma, given his history, as well as obviously trying to get you to think about occupational asthma arising directly from the things he's working with. Maybe that could be clearer. Um, but Ryan, the question of what is his risk of developing occupational asthma, given there may be some specific things in the workplace, given he, he does have, let's for the sake of argument assume, he does have a proven history of at least childhood asthma. Is he at risk, increased risk, if he should meet Western Redwood Cedar or Tasmanian Blackwood or whatever, of developing an occupational asthma? So if you have a background history of an atopic condition, whether it's uh, childhood uh, asthma or uh, allergic rhinitis or a family history, that increases the risk of uh, occupational asthma associated with the, uh, the high molecular weight group, so the proteins, which I'll be talking about in just a tick. But it hasn't been shown to be associated with the, uh, the low molecular weight group, the chemicals. So I would have to say no in this situation. So if it was wood dust, we would be concerned about one of those chemicals within the wood itself, which is in the low molecular weight group. So its history of asthma wouldn't be a, a, a risk factor in that situation. Okay. So now let's just assume that he, you're looking from the point of view of getting the job. Does he need to wear dust masks or what's any sort of respiratory protection perhaps? And should he also have regular lung function test monitoring? Uh, so I think we're back to tables over here, and I'd like to begin again with you, if we could, please. Um, depending on what uh, his trigger is, if the trigger is a chemical that's found at workplace, the dust mask would, wouldn't help. And if it's severe, um, then we should be questioning whether he should be actually working in that environment as well. He can't be, um, there will be <coughs> dust in the environment, um, or in, unless he wears the dust mask everywhere, it would be quite hard to protect him against. Right, uh, and what about the question of regular lung function tests on him? Yeah, uh, should he proceed, then he should have regular lung function tests to, to monitor uh, uh, his lung and whether he's had worsening of his asthma. How often are you going to do these tests on him? <laughs> yeah, so it will be, I think, depending on what, what his job is within uh, the workplace and the exposure, and if he's um, um, working in a very intense, dusty area, then I think it has to be more frequent rather than, say, for the first, um, before he start work, 
as a baseline and subsequently um, I w my person, I, my person without okay, so. scientific, <laughs> scientific uh, backup, I would, I would actually do it in two weeks. I don't, I don't know if that's appropriate. Table off yeah. the back, please, or you take the mic up there. And again, the same questions to you. What's the need for him to wear a dust mask? I must admit we're getting pretty vague about his exposures at this stage, so it's a fairly open question. Uh, and, but I'm interested in how you would evaluate his need to wear a dust mask. And then should he have regular lung function tests? So if he does have um, quite volatile asthma, I would strongly recommend him to wear a dust mask. Um, but if it's, you know, just a um, family history of atopy, um, I think I would let him off the dust mask um, if, you know, it's not a requirement of his workplace because sometimes you want to integrate into your workplace and you don't want to look a bit odd with, as the only one with the dust mask. Um, but um, I agree with Chung, I think I will uh, do his lung function test at the second week after he starts. Yeah. All right. This is a tricky one. And Ryan, I think we're looking for some guidance from you. Obviously, I think weighing up the dust mask has been reasonably well done, but interested in your comments. And then this one about should we go on with regular lung function tests is a very postgraduate question, I think. Um, I think the, the question of the dust mask, and as we all know, personal protective equipment is the lowest level of uh, hierarchy of control measures. And uh, I think if a dust mask is recommended, it really needs to be part of a comprehensive uh, program for that worker, so it needs to be a mask that's uh, appropriately selected for the environment, that's fit tested, that's well maintained. So I think uh, that, that, that may be a consideration, but uh, getting back to assessing the environment, you know, whether there are good engineering controls there, trying to liaise with the, uh, the employer about that to control dust exposure levels would be uh, far more uh, helpful for that worker and other workers too. Um, in terms of regular lung function testing, um, I think that uh, uh, it's not uh, a mandatory. Obviously, in this environment, it's not a, an exposure unlike isocyanates uh, that you need to have lung function testing done periodically. But I think it would be good practice to do it at baseline and uh, probably every three to six months, I think, probably in the first two years. But, but more importantly than that, having the worker well educated about what potential symptoms they may be experiencing and how to act upon those symptoms, so who to talk to um, and uh, to be open about that uh, with uh, the doctor and their employer. Um, so these were just some of my responses to some of those things. Wood dust is, a, is a work is a very common exposure really in a variety of uh, industries, whether it's uh, in a building trade or as you know, working at the sawmill. Um, and uh, asthma is a very common disease. So you, when you have a, a worker that has asthma, uh, it, it's important to weigh up discrimination versus uh, risk. And in this situation, the severity of that asthma is very very, very important to assess if you're going to say potentially to that worker that they can't be employed in that, uh, that situation. And as we talked about before, 20% of people at this age of 18 have ever been diagnosed with asthma. Um, wood dust is a uh, potential respiratory uh, sensitizer, um, but definitely going to be an irritant as well in that situation. Um, and again, just assessing asthma characteristics, not just yes, asthma, no asthma, um, but more about the asthma, you know, what, what the severity of it is and uh, exacerbating factors. And if you're not sure, doing lung function testing is very important. So doing spirometry and possibly a, a bronchial challenge if you're still not sure. And just before we move on, I did like it, one or two tables brought up the fact I would be asking the employer to go and have a look at the workplace to help me in my assessment of um, this guy, um, I think in an oral, you'll get a nice little tick down the bottom of the examiner's paper. Okay, um, Ryan, if you'd like to carry on. I'm sorry for the interstate people. We've got problems of liaising with you, and I hope you can just appreciate this uh, panacea of information and knowledge that's coming from here. Okay, Ryan. Thanks, Bruce. 
So, um, so moving on now to, uh, to occupational asthma, so asthma caused by work, as we talked about before, it's an occupational disease uh, characterised by the typical features of asthma and it is uh, certainly not an uncommon condition and we estimate now based on epidemiological evidence from overseas, we've got very, very, very poor Australian data that between 15 and 20 per cent of adult onset asthma is caused by occupational exposures. So a really significant contributor to adult onset asthma. And there's major discrepancies though in some of this data and um, in terms of uh, health professional diagnosed occupational asthma, it's been estimated to account for almost 5%, but in self-reported uh, work-related asthma, this is more like uh, 18 to 20 per cent. So um, this is data from the, uh, the SABRE program, which was the, uh, the surveillance program for uh, occupational lung disease that was run in Victoria and Tasmania up until the mid 2000s. And it was a voluntary reporting scheme where occupational physicians and some respiratory physicians uh, would report cases of occupational lung disease. And they certainly noted that asthma was the most common uh, condition that was seen. And uh, this is similar to many other uh, developed countries. So sensitizer induced occupational asthma is the most common form of uh, occupational asthma. So it accounts for 90% of all cases of uh, occupational asthma. And a sensitizer, a workplace sensitizer, an agent is an agent at work that can cause uh, asthma through a specific immunological response. So it's an immunological disease. And we divide the causes of sensitizer-induced occupational asthma to the high molecular weight group and the low molecular weight group, um, which is important. It's not just, you know, it's about trying to put people in boxes and expose in boxes, but it's helpful from a clinical point of view too. Uh, the high molecular weight group, uh, the group that um, are more, uh, more proteins and they induce a specific IgE-mediated uh, response and very typical allergic uh, symptoms. And those uh, factors such as these, like uh, animal allergens, um, obviously farmers may be exposed, people that work with laboratory animals. So I see quite a lot of uh, workers from the research labs that are around the Alfred Hospital. And um, people that work in, um, in uh, pet shops, uh, just, a, just a, a sea of, uh, of allergens in those pet shops. And, uh, and vets, I had a patient that uh, was a vet that uh, was allergic to cats and she was working in this cat only clinic down the road in Paran, which was a bit of a problem for her. Um, and then other things like plants, uh, plant products um, such as natural rubber latex, uh, pleasingly much less of a problem now than it was in the 1990s. Um, cereal and grains, um, the, uh, the grain work is here being exposed. Um, food industry is really important um, uh, sector as well that may be exposed to, uh, to a variety of, uh, of, uh, of agents um, uh, such as uh, bakers being exposed to, uh, to flour, so wheat flour, rye flour, some of the enzymes that are used in the baking process like, uh, like uh, alpha amylase. Um, and uh, then a variety of other things as well that you can see here. So, so really, you know, a large group of uh, workers are exposed to these types of, uh, of agents. And then there are the low molecular weight uh, group, which are the chemicals. And these, uh, these agents um, uh, are associated with uh, a, an immunological response, but it's not been through demonstration of specific IgE. So we think that they, many of them work as a hapten and they bind with other, um, other uh, proteins. And we may sometimes see specific IgE with things like um, complex uh, platinum salts and some screening programs for uh, platinum exposed workers will do specific IgE testing for platinum. Um, acid anhydrides, um, some reactive dyes, you can see IgE, but the most of the, uh, the uh, low molecular weight chemicals, um, we won't be able to demonstrate IgE, and in particular the diisocyanate groups um, have not uh, been demonstrated to be associated with IgE production in terms of a diagnostic uh, process. 
but a very, very important group. I'm sure that, uh, that all of you are aware that diastocyanates are used in the production of a variety of, uh, of um, products, uh, especially uh, polyurethane, whether it's uh, rigid or flexible uh, foam, as well as hardeners in uh, urethane spray paint and adhesives. So this is uh, this spray-on uh, insulation. Has anybody come across this as part of their work? Um, yeah, so this is, a, is a, obviously a foam insulation that I first came across uh, when I was in Canada. And um, we had big concerns in terms of uh, the isocyanide exposure that the workers would have. But we were pleased to find that, um, that the control measures were actually very good in the industry that we looked at uh, over there. I haven't seen any workers that uh, have presented to me with this issue, but um, it's certainly one to be aware of um, where there's likely to be significant isocyanide exposure. And then the, the classic, uh, the, uh, the, the spray painter that works down at the, uh, the local panel beater that um, is using a two-pack spray paint with a diastocyanate, it's a hardening agent in that two-pack spray paint, uh, working in, a, uh, in the, the small uh, spray booth, no respiratory protection on at all, um, probably hasn't been provided to the, uh, the poor worker. Um, so that's uh, obviously the classic one uh, of diastocyanate associated with occupational asthma. And, uh, but there are certainly a lot of other uh, low molecular weight agents. So as I said before, the wood dust, um, although you, know, you may think initially a high molecular weight, they actually are low molecular weight. Um, complex platinum salts, um, biocides. So biocides which are used uh, in healthcare, so things like formaldehyde is not really used that much, uh, isn't really used anymore, um, but glutaraldehyde was, um, and that's used a bit less now. I can't remember the name of the agent that's used off the top of my head, but there are reports now of the substitutes actually also causing sensitised reduced occupational asthma. So this is the agent that we use to clean up bronchoscopes and you know, all the other sort of scopes. Um, as well as uh, some of the hand washes that we use, so the chlorhexidine hand washes um, have been, so there's a lot of the allergy problems, um, skin allergy as well as um, respiratory allergy. Uh, persulfates uh, down at the, uh, the local hairdresser, so used uh, for, uh, for dyeing of, uh, of hair. Um, as well as uh, drugs in pharmaceutical workers and, uh, and uh, pharmacists. Oh, and that's uh, Western Red Cedar, so very lovely wood and certainly used much more uh, frequently in Australia than it was uh, five or ten years ago. But irritant-induced occupational asthma uh, is a really interesting condition and this is the current um, uh, criteria for irritant-induced occupational asthma. So the terminology sort of goes back and forth a little bit. I do prefer irritant-induced occupational asthma than RAD. Um, Brooks, who first described RADS in 1985, uh, had some uh, very tight criteria for uh, RADS. And uh, Susan Taylor in 2014 published these modified uh, criteria for RADS or acute irritant induced occupational asthma, which is a bit more of a mouthful than RADS. And, uh, and her criteria was that uh, the um, workers should have uh, new onset asthma or recurrence of childhood asthma, so don't have active asthma at the time of the exposure. And the symptoms relate to one or more high level exposures, whereas previously it was very much after one high level incident, whereas now it can be more than one uh, exposure that may induce uh, the onset of symptoms. And symptoms can begin greater than 24 hours after exposure. That was the other, one of the other stri really strict criteria was that you had to present to an emergency department or for emergency care within 24 hours of the exposure. So it may have onset of symptoms within a few days of that exposure. Um, exposures can be very high levels of, uh, of gases, fumes, uh, sprays or highly irritating dust. And you need to demonstrate uh, airway hyper-responsiveness or uh, significant reversible airflow obstruction, as I've talked about before. And symptoms need to persist for greater than or equal to three months. So if you have really transient symptoms, that may be just due to the airway in irritation, inflammation, you may get transient bronchial hyper-responsiveness. So you shouldn't really be doing testing to try to diagnose um, irritant-induced occupational asthma until three months after the, uh, the exposure. 
So one of the, uh, the, uh, the important groups that have been well studied in terms of uh, this type of occupational asthma is in the World Trade Centre responders. And the responders were exposed to very high levels of an extremely alkaline concrete dust, as you can see here. And they were exposed for several days after the, um, the, the World Trade Centre disaster. And at one year, 16% of people that had a high level of exposure were considered to have irritant-induced asthma, so quite a considerable proportion of those responders. And at nine years following the, uh, the, the disaster, there were 36% of that group that uh, the symptoms had resolved. So there was a substantial proportion that still had active symptoms uh, many, many years after the exposure. And it's previously been thought of that, uh, that irritant-induced asthma is a very self-limiting condition that um, maybe only have symptoms for a few, uh, a couple of years and then just goes away. Uh, but this data and some other data shows that uh, often it is a very persistent condition. Um, so irritant-induced asthma, occupational asthma is, is in some ways a little bit more straightforward than diagnosing sensitizer-induced. And so much of it goes back to the, the clinical history, so the history of the exposure and what actually happened at that time, and that there's no history of asthma prior to that exposure. Because you'd imagine if there's somebody that has a background history of, of asthma and then they're exposed to an irritant, then it's more likely they've got work exacerbated asthma, whereas somebody that doesn't have asthma and now they've got symptoms after the exposure, then it's more likely to be new onset uh, occupational asthma. And again, very important to check for, uh, to do uh, objective tests, so uh, spirometry with, air, with bronchodilator response or a, uh, and or a, a airway uh, hyperresponsive challenge. So in terms of sensitizer induced, this is a condition that uh, should be suspected in every adult with new onset asthma or in adults with asthma that is difficult to control or if you've got somebody with asthma that works in a high-risk uh, occupation, such as working at a bakery or the pet shop. And uh, it's important really to find out about the job that the worker had when the symptoms of asthma started to develop. So you may be seeing them uh, five or 10 years after the onset of their asthma symptoms. So taking a really thorough occupational history going back throughout their careers to all the duties, all the jobs that they've had and the duties they've had during those jobs to try to find out what those first, the first job was related to their exposure, the onset of their symptoms. And uh, symptoms of uh, sensitizer induced occupational asthma are variable. So it's not as though everybody with this condition will walk into their workplace on Monday morning and get asthma symptoms. Often symptoms will only develop towards the end of a work shift. Uh, you may have a, a late response, which is when somebody actually leaves the workplace and then they get their asthma symptoms in the evening when they've actually completely left work. Uh, or particularly or possibly even during the night. But typically symptoms will, uh, re will improve or completely go away when workers are away from work. So when they're um, on holidays or over weekends, their asthma symptoms will improve. So it's a much better question to ask, does your asthma get better when you're away from work rather than are you worse uh, when you go to work? Um, we also call uh, this form of asthma uh, occupational asthma with latency, which is reflecting that people don't develop symptoms on the first day that they're at work exposed to the agent. So the baker entering the bakery uh, is not going to develop asthma on the first day they're exposed to flour. It develops after a period of time from the initial exposure, and that might be a few weeks of exposure, it might be many years after exposure. So, such as with laboratory animal allergy, uh, that can develop, uh, the, the average is about uh, 12 uh, to 24 months, but it can develop even 10 years after somebody's been exposed. So just because somebody hasn't developed symptoms early into their work doesn't mean it's not actually sensitizer induced occupational asthma. And an important uh, symptom to ask about, and an important disease in itself, is occupational rhinitis. Um, often with the high molecular weight agents, those proteins like, uh, like wheat flour, workers will develop uh, occupational rhinitis and conjunctivitis even before they get their asthma symptoms. So it can be a warning sign. They're saying to sneeze a lot of work. 
that maybe they are sensitised already to that agent and there is a risk of progression on to asthma. Um, so diagnosis uh, based on the history is very, uh, has a very poor specificity. So we need to perform investigations. We should do those investigations as early as possible and do those investigations whilst the worker is actually still at the workplace, he's still exposed to the agent that you're concerned about. And it's very rare not to be able to do that. Um, but unfortunately, I think sometimes advice is given to workers to uh, leave the workplace immediately when this is suspected rather than actually working through the diagnostic process while they're still actively working. So uh, three, the three steps really are to confirm the diagnosis of asthma, so objectively, as I've talked about before, and then identify the workplace as the cause of the patient's asthma. And then I also identify the specific agent at work that's caused the asthma. And there may be several investigations that are used and there's several flow charts that have been used. I know you can't read this, don't worry. Um, there are several flow charts that have been developed to work through this process. Uh, this is one that was published in a uh, really uh, useful uh, review article in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, in 2014 um, of uh, occupational asthma. And um, I won't go through this in detail, but um, it's uh, very useful. Um, but essentially, you're obtaining a, a work history and a clinical history that's suggestive of the condition. You will be doing um, baseline lung function testing where you're looking for airflow obstruction or bronchial hyperresponsiveness. When we've got a high molecular weight agent, sometimes we can do skin prick testing or specific IgE testing. So we'll do that with things like, uh, like the, the cats and the uh, laboratory animal allergens. So for, uh, for mice, we'll do uh, uh, mouse urine, uh, an epithelial uh, allergen as well as, the, uh, the da as, well as uh, dander. And, um, but we can't do that for the, uh, the low molecular weight group. But then looking at the association between asthma and work, we will request that patients keep a peak flow uh, readings for four weeks. And at least one of those weeks should be away from work. So we're looking for that variation of their peak flows, which is consistent with asthma, that variability, but we're looking to see if that variability is associated with their work exposures. So when they're away from work, does their lung function actually improve over that, uh, that week? Very useful test. I think it's underutilised. I think uh, when, we, when we get patients to do this, I always get them to write down the uh, peak flow uh, number result rather than get them to chart it as you would normally do for asthma management, you know, the normal peak flow charts. If you do that, then often patients will see graphically what's going on and there is a bit of a tendency to to, to, uh, to, to not so much manipulate the scheme, but uh, to, to maybe provide the doctor results that the patient thinks that you're after. So it's better to get them to write down the number and then plot it yourself. There is a, a program called Oasis, which you can download off the internet and you can plug the data into Oasis and that will give you a, a, a probability of a work association. So that's developed by a group in the UK. But what I uh, rely upon is um, doing serial methacholine challenges or bronchial hyperresponsiveness challenges, a bit of argument between mannitol and methacholine in the situation. But essentially what I would request is that the first test that I do, this first one, is done when the worker is at work towards the end of the week, so their normal working week. And preferably they've been at work in the morning doing their usual duties that's typically associated with their symptoms and then they come into the lab early in the afternoon and then we do a bronchial provocation test. And if the worker has got active symptoms, they've been exposed and that challenge test is negative, it means that it's very, very unlikely they've got occupational asthma. So it essentially rules it out. If it's positive, so they've got evidence of asthma, then what we want to see is, is there an improvement in that level of hyperresponsiveness when they're away from work? So they should be off work for between 10 and 14 days, which I know can be difficult to arrange that. 
Um, and then we repeat the challenge test, repeat the bronchial provocation test, and we're looking for a three-fold or greater change in the PC20, so that level of hyper-responsiveness, so they're less sensitive after they've been away from work for that period of time. And so that uh, is very supportive of uh, sensitizer-induced occupational asthma. Uh, we can probably come back to talk about that when we go through the case, but uh, um, there's, there's significant uh, implications of the diagnosis of occupational asthma. So, so it's really important not to label somebody with this condition if you're not sure that that's what they have, because uh, this is international data, but it all shows there's major work disruption once somebody's been labelled with occup sensitizer induced occupational asthma. Considerable loss of income as well for these workers too. Uh, but on the, uh, on the flip side, if you miss the diagnosis and then somebody is still actually working and still exposed to the agent that's caused their occupational asthma, lung function will progressively decline. And as you decline, asthma becomes more severe and much, much less likely to improve when you're away from work, when you've actually identified the problem and removed from, from work. So the longer somebody goes on being exposed, the more lung function they lose, the more likely they are to end up with chronic lung disease as a result of it. So uh, in terms of management, um, early diagnosis uh, is very important, um, obtaining an accurate diagnosis. Removing the exposure from the worker is, more, is ideal rather than removing the worker from the workplace. So if you can remove the actual agent that's caused occupational asthma, so the particular chemical, uh, natural rubber latex is a great example of that. So when it was identified that it was a major sensitizer, the removal of uh, powdered latex gloves has substantially reduced the occurrence of occupational asthma in the healthcare industry. So removing the agents is ideal. Um, but if it's not possible, in some circumstances, the worker may have to be moved to a different part of the, uh, the plant or the, the facility, if it's all possible, um, or maybe have to be, uh, they may have to change their job. Uh, then uh, pharmacological management is as per uh, guidelines in terms of medication. You always need to think about uh, workers' compensation in this situation, especially if somebody needs to change their work um, and obviously will require assistance with that process. And uh, as an independent medical examiner, um, I cannot tell you how frustrated I am when I see workers that have claims submitted that have never had lung function done. And it just still staggers me that uh, even spirometry is not done, or spirometry is done, there's been no assessment of, uh, bronchial, of, um, of uh, bronchodilator response, and somebody's been labelled as having a significant lung disease. Um, so a thorough evaluation, you don't have to go through all this process, you know, obviously a referral to a respiratory physician is, uh, is an acceptable means of assessing these patients, but uh, um, at least you know, baseline lung function should be performed. And uh, then um, monitoring the patient, if they do actually have to change jobs, then the, the, the treatment shouldn't end at that point. You really should continue to monitor them to ensure that they're still safe in their new work environment. So their asthma may still be present, they may be at risk of work exacerbated asthma in their next job, um, or they may still be exposed to that sensitizer in their new workplace. So monitoring them over the next two to five years potentially just to ensure that they have had safe uh, re-employment uh, I think is really important as well. Um, but prevention is possible, so uh, we all are very familiar with our hierarchy of control measures. This is a, uh, a research laboratory which contains um, uh, uh, mice and so the mice are in these individual uh, containers and there is um, uh, negative pressure uh, ventilation here with extraction in through the room, uh, through the chambers and then out through these exhausts in the, uh, the ceiling. So uh, it really substantially minimises the amount of allergen in the, uh, in the air. And this is in comparison to some other research labs uh, uh, that I've heard of overseas, like some very uh, well-known uh, universities where 
uh, researchers would have their mice sitting on the desk in a cage next to them where they're eating lunch, and uh, um, and you know, not not surprising they run into problems. So uh, again, asking all patients uh, that have asthma what they do for work, considering whether the work may have caused asthma or may worsen their asthma control. Um, suspecting uh, that work may have influenced asthma as either a cause or an aggravating factor. History alone is very poor in terms of specificity for asthma generally, but in particular for occupational asthma. So we need to perform objective lung function testing. Early intervention is really very important in terms of prognosis. So uh, telling the worker with occupational asthma just to put a mask on, you'll be right, uh, is not a way of uh, managing these patients and uh, it is a preventable cause of, uh, of asthma. So uh, we have our second case. Uh, Bruce wants to run through. No, no, it's the same rules as before. Bruce, before you go to the second case, I actually own the Swell Furniture Factory, and I'm very grateful for the update on all the factors that are involved in occupational asthma. But the question you asked was, should I employ this bloke or not, or this girl? I don't know which this is, but... Uh, John. John. Thank you. Uh, should I employ? You're, that's the one we say for the oral. What does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's an oral yeah, no, but really, uh, there is no clear answer because you haven't been given enough information. But it's an idea is to break it apart as to what are the factors that you would need to then make a decision about John working in that place. I think you have to say that I think there, there have to be significant risk to say that you wouldn't employ that uh, that person though. I think you'd have to be clear because otherwise really there's significant issues in terms of discrimination if you say that he can't work in that environment. So I think if he's had uh, you know, ICU admissions, he's had frequent exacerbations that have been related to uh, similar exposures that he's going to have at that workplace like dust and exercise then it's probably justifiable but uh, otherwise I don't think it would be. Just to finish your answer, it wasn't Swell Furniture, it was um, a place I went to in Bendigo with the medical students there and it was immaculately run. They had extraordinarily good exhaust ventilation of all machines and you could almost run your finger over surfaces and find only a little dust. And again, it's like someone said, you'd really want to go to the workplace because in that situation, if you had a person whose asthma had allegedly ceased when they were 12 years old, now they're 18, you'd say, yeah, look, they're a pretty good bet. And in fact, like someone said, you would hardly worry about them even wearing a dust mask uh, in that situation. Yeah, well, so, my bank, too, and my mouse device. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> we'll come on to the second case and the idea is again we'll work around the tables and then we'll have general discussion. I must admit I didn't give opportunity for that after the first case but all the rest of you can then join in with uh, questions after we finish this case. And it's about Farad, who's 18 years of age. He presents with almost daily symptoms of itchy eyes, stuffy nose, cough, shortness of breath, and wheeze. He says he wakes most days with a wheeze and describes frequent use of salbutamol. Recently been on holiday and felt better during that time. He has a past history of seasonal hay fever. And on further questioning, Farid reveals that he has been working in a bakery for 12 months. Um, one of his roles is to weigh the flour. His nasal and eye symptoms started three months ago, followed by chest symptoms two months later. His symptoms improve modestly over the weekend and recur within minutes of starting work. So how would you proceed to investigate and diagnose him and how would you manage him? Okay, so you've got group discussions to begin with and then we'll take uh, the spokespeople from the groups. Thank you. 
Okay. All right, let's um, begin to see how we all went. Um, who's got the microphone? We've got a microphone, please. Oh, good. Would you mind beginning since you've got the microphone? Could you tell us about how would you proceed to investigate and diagnose Farid with his range of symptoms? Does the mic work? Testing. We could do a serial pick flow while he's at work um, and then do it um, after being away from work for a week uh, and looking at the pattern and w looking at the pattern of exacerbation. Um, we can also do a. This is a peak expiratory flow, is it? Yes. Yep. And Keep also, uh, you can do a spirometry test, um, and with um, uh, see if it improves with um, sabutamol, um, and you can also do a, a manitol challenge with the spirometry test as well. Um, you know, uh, when he's at work, and also when he's away from work, whether there's any changes. Um, that's to confirm the diagnosis and the next step would be, you know, if the diagnosis is confirmed, um, is it related to work? Um, and lastly, uh, we want to check which um, trigger it is um, from work as the cause of the problem. Yeah, well, doing the weekly, that weekly diary of peak expiratory flow really does take you into the is it related to work question anyhow. Mm -hmm. Your first question, I think, has he got asthma, then is it related to work? Okay, what about the table down here? Uh, sorry, table up there, since you've got the microphone up there. Okay, how would you proceed to investigate and diagnose Farid? if you want to. I think this is a fairly sparse history to begin with. Um, I'd like to know a great deal about, oh, I know it says his symptoms have onset in the last three months, but I, I really want to drill down. Um, to well, I'm still at work and Hello. I said to Mitch, you're coming home, you'll be home tonight. Hello, we got some... <laughs> um. <laughs> 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 okay, try, try again, would you please? Yeah, I can't get too close. Let's speak up. Too loud as well. So, um, so you'd be concentrating on getting the the diagnosis right in the first well, yeah, place. That's got to be king. That's very that's paramount. Um, it's a good looking, good sounding story for work related asthma and no, no doubt about it. But um, it's very important to know whether this is the only episode. I think um, in terms of. Uh, so I spent a good length of time talking about his his history, what his symptoms really mean for him. I would like to know a lot more about his his hay fever too. Um, undoubtedly, the fellow has 
chest symptoms, no doubt about that. Um, we want spirometry with reversibility the first time we meet him, I think. Um, he's a very good candidate for a serial peak flow diary, I think, but I would be looking to visit his work site just as soon as possible before planning anything more. Um, flower seems a likely culprit, but um, there might be a great deal of other things that we need to plan for when considering investigating him further. Thank you. Just pass the mic on down to this table over here, would you please? Who is the spokesperson over here? Good, let you have a go, would you please? Yep, How so would you proceed to investigate and diagnose Farid? Um, so similarly, we hopefully have taken a very good history and then we do a spirometry with bronchodilator um, reversibility testing, um, serial peak flow measurements and so we came to the same conclusion. Right. If the peak flow pattern were not very clear, we probably proceed to mental testing. Yeah. I guess we're trying to emphasize, has he got asthma? Is it due to the workplace? Um, and then are there particular agents there that you're interested in that triad and things to try and bring that out in this um, exercise and for your orals as well. Um, now, supposing we've got a problem here with him, um, back to this table here with the mic, um, how would you manage him? Well, let's assume now we've diagnosed Baker's asthma. How would you manage him? If possible. Yeah. If possible, we'd like to um, alter the environment that he's working in. Um, for example, like engineering control, where the uh, ventilation can be improved at work. Um, so go through the hierarchy of controls, and including uh, the ventilation, the PPEs. If that's um, not possible or can't be uh, uh, optimized, then he might have to change position within the company. Um, working in another area, but if that's not possible again, then he might have to change job. Yes, I think he started as a baker's a as a, an apprentice baker, didn't he? At 18 or something <laughs> like that, and that was to be part of his not so, Peter. No, Farid's actually an Iranian refugee who was fortunate enough to get a job. Job, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when he came, he brought his Persian cat. Yeah, he got a job at 7-Eleven, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Would you mind passing the mic up the back there because we want to explore this a bit more about how would you manage this chap who's, well, for the sake of argument, we'll say has got Baker's asthma. How would you be managing him? We can use, um, so besides, you know, um, managing situation at his work, we can use pharmacological intervention. Um, you know, do we want to start him on some uh, long acting beta agonies or corticosteroids, uh, inhalers um, to control the asthma? Um, also, you know, educate him about um, appropriate um, puffers, technique, and things like that. So you'll be looking at the actual treatment of the asthma yes. to see if that can yeah. be optimised? I mean, Chung's already covered, um, you know, how we're probably going to manage him at work. So, I, you know, I thought maybe okay, we forget that. Um, he's he still have a medical condition. We could probably, you know, use something to help him with his symptoms um, in the meantime, um, while we sort things at work. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, I think we've gone around the tables enough. Uh, Ryan, it's a bit tricky. Um, first of all, let's begin with the more easy part of it about proceeding to investigate and diagnose mm. him, and then we'll come to the crunch. Um, so I think in terms of. Uh, 
His history is extremely uh, suggestive in this very brief uh, scenario that we've got. It's very suggestive of, uh, uh, of sensitised to induced occupational asthma because he's got a background history of atopy, having a history of seasonal hay fever, and now he's exposed to a high molecular weight agent at uh, work, so being either one of the flowers or an enzyme possibly. So, but taking a comprehensive history about the actual uh, bakery, is it a small independent bakery at the local shopping centre? Is it a big industrial bakery where there's more likely to be better controls in place? And you know, you, you, you're often in a better position than I am to be able to go out and perform a worksite visit that I can't uh, do um, or don't do. Um, and, uh, and really getting a better understanding as to what the actual exposures are, what the dust control measures are like actually at that, uh, that, that workplace. But then you know, I would do, as I think you know, many of you described, doing uh, objective tests tests once you've got a more formal history, um, especially bronchial provocation testing after he's been at work. Um, in terms of management though, uh, just it's important to remember that you know in this situation it's, it's a sentinel health event. So if you've diagnosed this man with uh, uh, occupational asthma, you've got to think beyond this one worker. You've got to think about the entire workplace, and there are, it, it does it does um, suggest that uh, dust control measures aren't as good as they should be, and that uh, the other workers are at risk as well. And certainly in bakeries there are a lot of strategies that can be employed to reduce dust. Uh, levels. So one of the, the biggest problems is the uh, uh, flour that's often put on um, working bench tops that you'll see in like the Baker's Delight or Brumby's ad when they uh, throw the dough down onto the bench and there's a cloud of uh, flour comes up which makes me cringe a little bit. But there are other agents that can be put on the bench that stop the dough sticking and lids that are put on the large chambers that are used for the, for the mixing. So there's a couple of really good studies that have looked at uh, those sort of interventions. So uh, going back to think about how, um, how those control measures are being used at the workplace. But the other point to make is that not everybody with uh, sensitised induced occupational asthma has to leave work. If you, if in your, it's very much on a case by case basis. So if in your opinion, his asthma is, is mild, then maybe you can continue to observe him for a period of time, maybe observe him over the next 12 months or so. It's that discussion you need to have with him. He need, you need to tell him that there is a risk of his asthma progressively getting worse if he stays in that workplace. But you know, he's a career baker now. He's decided this is what he's going to do as his job. And for you to say that he can't work in that profession anymore, you're likely to lose the, uh, the, the uh, therapeutic uh, relationship you have and he's not going to come back. So um, you, you're better to, uh, to work with him through the process and monitor him over time. I have a patient that's uh, similar to this with Baker's asthma and uh, he, he wouldn't leave work, which is fine. We've continued to monitor him. And now he's, he's setting up his own business as a um, making those, uh, those Spanish donuts Donuts, which requires much less dust, the churros, uh, much less uh, dust uh, exposure. So I'm hoping that that will be successful for him. But he's well aware of the risks of uh, of his uh, decisions. Okay, so we've opened up for general discussion now. We're focused. I've kept the lid on discussion about the cases, but now, everyone, uh, your question about occupational asthma, I will work exacerbated asthma. That's all right, please. Just to warn you, I got up at 4.30 this morning to go to Sydney and I'm, I'm waning a little bit. If I start getting a bit uh, incohesive then, or incoherent, so I can't even say the word. David Fish. Just a quick one about this, this case study here. No one's mentioned the role of allergy tests, rest or skin prick tests. So question, uh, just a comment on that. In this situation, is it of any value? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think at any time there's a situation where somebody's exposed to a high molecular weight agent that we have uh, RAST or skin prick testing available, uh, it should be done. And there, there's, uh, because it builds, the, it builds the picture. I was talking to a group about this before. It, it just builds the case that if he's sensitised to uh, 
uh, wheat flour and rye flour uh, with those symptoms with suggestive lung function it all builds a case that he's got occupational asthma related to that agent um, and sometimes the, the, the RAS tests or skin prick tests are done even as surveillance in this industry so um, even in workers that are asymptomatic identification of sensitization is a risk that they may go on and develop occupational asthma so it may be a way of uh, implementing a control so they don't actually develop it. Brian, in your experience as a respiratory physician, have you found that people with occupational asthma are more prone to developing quite severe asthma attacks or does it just tend to be more chronic, um, moderate to mild asthma? So, so the literature certainly suggests that uh, Asthma associated with occupational asthma is more severe than garden variety non work related asthma. Um, in my experience, I haven't really seen that, I must say. You know, I, I'd see it being similar to, to a, other forms of asthma that I see you know, as a respiratory physician, which is obviously different to what uh, GPs would see in their practice. So I might have a bit of a skewed perspective, but uh, uh, in, in my patients, it's pretty similar. If you had a patient with asthma that you were worried about, occupational asthma or work-related asthma, would you send them to a private uh, respiratory physician or to a, such a unit such as yourselves? And practically, how long does it take to get into a unit such as yourselves? Um, so uh, there's, there's some of those options and uh, referral to an asthma service that's got an allergy um, interest I think is probably the best way to do it. Um, so the, we're fortunate that the clinic that, uh, that I work at at the Alfred uh, draws upon the respiratory and allergy side of things and, uh, and then I look at things from an occupational point of view. So referral to our difficult asthma clinic or the asthma service there generally they screen the referrals so we have one of our asthma nurses triage them all and if they see um, in your referral notes that uh, you know I'm concerned about severe asthma occupational uh, uh, contributor then they'll get the patient in and probably about uh, a month within a month Probably privately, um, there is. Privately depends a bit. You know, if you can, if the the employer is on board, then they will often pay for the evaluation. If they don't, it's not hugely out of pocket. I don't cost that much, but uh, it's uh, it's only a good avenue as well. So I think uh, ideally through the public, because I think it's a great way to get our respiratory trainees exposed to these sorts of problems um, in, in terms of assessment. Um, but I must say, I think uh, time-wise, it's often quicker to send them privately. Is there any relationship between late onset asthma and occupational asthma? Do you find that there, you often, when you dig back, that in actual fact, the late onset has an occupational basis? Um, do you mean uh, by late onset, uh, like adult onset asthma? Yes. Yeah. So, so yes, and, and I think if somebody presents with asthma for the first time during adult life, then that's, that's a red flag, you know, that uh, it may well be associated with, uh, with work. And we estimate that it's between 15 and 20 percent of those people is actually specifically caused by work exposures. So it's difficult when you've got somebody that's had uh, childhood asthma and then it's gone away and then recurred as an adult. So in that, uh, that 12 to 14 percent of children, probably about four or five percent of them lose their asthma and uh, then when it recurs an adult teasing out that from new onset asthma but but yeah definitely definitely it's a it's a red flag um, one thing that I think we've all seen is the sort of healthy worker effect and I mean I've certainly seen a lot of people over the years where you've been asking about their occupational history in a general context and you find that you know they probably have had occupational asthma which is undiagnosed maybe untreated um, but they've left the industry they've done a bit of you know they've worked in a grain silo or they've worked in a bakery or they've done all of that so what are your comments on uh, on that yeah absolutely I think that that certainly happens and um 
It, it may be because the, uh, the the worker themselves haven't actually identified that link between their work and their respiratory symptoms. Um, or their doctor hasn't made that connection either. And so we would prefer that connection to be made and then the worker to actually be supported through the transition to a different job, retraining, workers' compensation, um, if, uh, if it is properly identified. But yeah, I think that's what happens, generally speaking. I think people get symptoms. They, they may be in a small industry, small workplace, and they just leave in the end. Yeah. Mm. And I think it's not always identified as being um, being either um, occupational, and they just say, "Oh, well, I started to wheeze when I worked here, and I left." Yeah, exactly. And I got better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll I'll start. Uh, I came with a number of questions about RADs, and you've answered actually some of them by the change of terminology to irritant-induced occupational asthma, because some of the rigidities of the previous RADS diagnosis have fallen away on what you've told me. The one remaining question I have is, uh, and it's a personal observation, not scientific, uh, and based on anecdote only, is there any difference in the spirometric uh, appearance values seen in this irritant form of occupational asthma than standard asthma. Does it look any different? Um, I've, I've noticed a lot of much greater amount of small airways disease rather than large airway diseases. Okay. My comment, uh, am I seeing something that's not there? <laughs> um, I'm sure not David, I'm <laughs> sure it's there. Uh, I, listen, I, I can't say for sure, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head, um, where there is more small airways disease with uh, with rads or not, um, I think it's to me. I think you're more likely to have more severe uh, airflow obstruction um, because often those patients are very symptomatic as well that have had a really high level of exposure. But is that the what's not captured by that uh, that new criteria is also the more uh, low level irritant level, low level exposures like uh, cleaners that may be exposed to not high peaks, but small peaks over a long period of time that have asthma. And there's, there's a fair bit of controversy in that group as to whether that issue is, is true irritant induced asthma or is it actually just work exacerbated asthma and they've developed asthma for other reasons. So there, there's a lot we don't know about, uh, about uh, irritant induced asthma. Ryan, is it good enough to, that, that Australian workers don't have access to, to uh, inhalational challenge like the Mon Montreal workers do? Mm. So just because something's listed on a, a material, material safety data sheet, do we need to prove that they actually have a, a sensitivity uh, occupationally? Yeah, so, so I didn't really go into specific challenges because everybody would have, uh, if you read something about occupational asthma, you will see something about specific challenges. But um, there's only several, there's only, there are certain centres around Europe and uh, in North America that do challenges. So they are the exception, not the rule throughout the world. Um, they uh, are difficult challenges to do. So this is not like doing a manitole challenge where you've got somebody in the lab for uh, 45 minutes. These challenges take three or four days to do. So you have a control day, you have first day really Really low level exposure, second day a bit higher level exposure, and you build up over four days. So it's not a not an easy challenge. I must say, in, in Quebec, they've sort of dug themselves a bit of a hole now, and they have to do challenges on every worker that's suspected to have work-related asthma to get compensation. So there's no there's no clinical judgment that's in it anymore. Um, so I don't think we need them. Um, so I don't think we've got we're doing a disservice. It, it's helpful. I think from uh, the academic side of me would like to be able to do it, uh, to have those facilities for research purposes, but I think in terms of uh, treatment and management, I don't think we need them. Okay, well, I think we're going to need to let uh, Ryan go home and get some sleep after a very early start. So thank you very much for all that. Um, I also want to say thank you to the trainees who um, volunteered to um, 
help us with the discussion. So I hope you got a lot out of this and be good for your orals later on. And uh, we'll see you again uh, whenever it is next month or the month after. Okay, that was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, sleep. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs>